30 million patients in the U.S., a 5% increase per year in newly diagnosed patients, the leading cause of kidney failure, non-traumatic limb amputation, and new cases of blindness every year, 176 billion spent on direct medical care in 2012, tens of billions spent on research over decades. Folks, we're talking about diabetes here. Welcome to Penin Peninsula Television. This is Diabetes A1C Forum, a monthly talk show dedicated to diabetic patients. I'm your host, Patrick Lehner, a type one diabetic. In the first half of today's show, I'll provide an overview of topics, areas of concern related to diabetes, and some insight as to what future shows will consist of. This will help you to understand where we're coming from and where we're headed. In the second half of the show, I'll be interviewing a very motivated and inspirational guest who is already practicing some of the concepts we'll be discussing here today. The reason I'm hosting this show is to provide a vehicle or framework for diabetic patients to come together for the purpose of improving our care and ultimately our health outlook. And here's why. Every time I think about diabetes statistics, I wonder if the patient is even a factor when decisions are being made about diabetes care. Recently, I've come to the conclusion that over time, the healthcare arena has gradually become unbalanced. My perspective is that this situation exists because patients have been removed from the process when it comes to deciding how and what will be delivered to us in terms of our care. Let's take a look at a snapshot of the healthcare arena. In this model, the healthcare and health insurance industries have kept their corners of the arena balanced by investing in key markets with the goal of maintaining a positive return on investment, or positive ROI. Diabetes is one of those markets. Keep in mind that this effort has been ongoing for many decades. They do not just sit back and collect money. Now, as you can see in this model, the imbalance occurs where patients are concerned. For decades, patients have not focused on achieving a positive patient return on investment, or positive PROI, within this healthcare arena. This has left our corner of the arena grossly out of balance. As a result, the PROI is negative. Why is this the case? It's because diabetic patients are not requiring measurable results from the healthcare and health insurance industries. We're simply sitting back and accepting products and services they decide to deliver to us, whether it provides value in terms of improved health outlook or not. The question we diabetic patients need to start asking ourselves is, for the billions we invest in our care and on research, what measurable results in terms of improved health outlook are we buying? In order to balance the patient corner of the healthcare arena with the healthcare and health insurance industries, diabetic patients need to collectively make it their mission to define, achieve, and maintain measurable improvements with regard to health outlook and actively redirect investments in healthcare to support the mission. In this way, we can pave the way to a positive patient return on investment within this arena just as the healthcare and health insurance industries have done when it comes to their return on investment. That brings me to the overall theme of Diabetes A1C Forum, which is also its mission, to influence improvements in diabetes care through patient collaboration. In other words, we want to establish a place at the table for diabetic patients to have input to and influence over decisions that are being made regarding our care. For the most part, those making decisions about our care are made up of representatives who do not suffer from diabetes themselves and who see diabetic patients as a marketplace to gain profits from. This is how our economy works, which is fine, but this perspective needs to be balanced with optimal patient care and continued measurable improvements in our health outlook. To do this will require continued and effective patient collaboration. By this, I mean diabetic patients need to become smarter and more demanding customers within the healthcare arena and work together to achieve measurable improvements in health outlook. This means we need to focus on creating patient value for patient dollars spent in order to achieve a positive patient return on investment, or positive PROI. So how do we do it? To get started, I've got some ideas in the form of goals, which I'll share with you now 
But after each show, I'll also need you diabetics out there to contribute valuable ideas that can help achieve these goals by posting your thoughts on my blog, www.diabetesa1cforum.com. I only ask that you please think about and limit your input to things that you think will help support these goals to accomplish the mission. The goals involved with accomplishing the mission of improving diabetes care are as follows. Number one, continually enhance patient understanding of the disease. That's what this show, Diabetes A1C Forum, is all about. As I mentioned, this is a monthly talk show, so we're going to have guests. Some of those guests are going to include other diabetic patients who have had to overcome issues with regard to their health care. And they're going to talk about how they overcame these issues. And newly diagnosed diabetics who are watching this show can listen to this. And if they ever come across the same issues down the road, they'll have some idea of how to deal with them. Another example of guests we'll be having will be research scientists. These scientists are working in the lab on new ways of treating diabetic patients. And we'll be talking to them about what those are and what the issues and concerns are about converting that research into actual patient care. And lastly, we'll have some healthcare professionals as guests on here. We'll talk to them about what types of care they're currently delivering. And some of the current currently delivered care, some of you may not know about, so it'll help you to understand what's available out there for you today in terms of diabetic care. Goal number two, develop and provide a platform for diabetic patients to build consensus and collaborate effectively. That's what the blog is for, www.diabetesa1cforum.com. So what I'm hoping that you diabetics will do is contribute ideas and advice and your thoughts about how we might go about collaborating around and accomplishing these goals I'm talking about right now. The third goal is to simplify the patient care process. So what I'm talking about here is under this goal, there are many things that can be done. So let me give you one example. So I, I would think it would be great if we could collaborate around the idea of putting together a national swipe card system. Now, many of you have probably had the same experience I've had when you walk into a doctor's office where the first thing that they do is hand you a clipboard where you got to fill out all your information manually. So what I would suggest here is that you'd have a kiosk in the lobby. And when you walk in, you just swipe in and all your basic information is downloaded into their computer database at the office there. And then secondly, along with that, would be a personal pin code system. So the more sensitive medical data about yourself, you could give permission for them to have that data either temporarily or permanently by inputting your pin code. Goal number four, properly interpret and effectively deploy existing knowledge gained from research. So what I'm talking about here is us diabetics rallying around the idea of finding the right people with the right backgrounds to look at these tens of billions of dollars in research that have already been done and the knowledge that's been gained from that and determine how much of that knowledge can be converted into newer and better ways to care for diabetics. The fifth goal is to tailor tests and treatments to each patient. And let me give you an example on this goal as well. So as I mentioned, I'm a type 1 diabetic. If you put another type 1 diabetic right next to me, the disease is going to affect each of us differently. Different symptoms are going to show up at different times, and we're going to be dealing with those differently. Some of them are going to be more serious for one than the other. And the reason for that is we're each different at the molecular and cellular level. So what I'm talking about here is if, you, if tests and treatments are based at the molecular and cellular level. They can be individualized. So if the doctor gets the results of your test, they can not only look at what's happening with the results at the molecular and cellular level, they could also determine of the treatment options out there, which one would be most effective and most compatible with your system at the molecular and cellular level. Goal number six is to achieve measurable results nationally and at the patient level. So if we go back to those statistics I mentioned at the beginning of the show, where we have roughly a 5% increase in newly diagnosed diabetics every year, a national re measurable result would be to see that number start to decrease every year, flatten out, and then go away. That would be a measurable result at the national level. 
At the patient level, if we go back to goal number five, where we're talking about these tests, getting test results at the molecular and cellular level, what would happen there is a doctor could look at those results over an 18 month, two year, four year period and determine if your health, health outlook is improving at the molecular and cellular level. If it isn't, then a treatment change is in order. So if we diabetics collaborate around accomplishing these six goals, I think there would be a huge improvement in our care and health outlook. Now if I think back 15 years ago when I was diagnosed with diabetes, I remember being told the same thing many of you were probably told. Genetics causes a disease, right? Well, over the years, I've become skeptical about this answer, and here's why. Let's take a look at this global map of diabetes prevalence done by Boston Scientific International. Here you'll see that in each major country, there's a light blue bar and a dark blue bar. The light blue bar represents diabetic population in the year 2000. The dark blue bar represents what the projected diabetic population based on current trends, will be by the year 2030. If you focus on the U.S.-Canada projection, this shows a 72% increase. Some of the other countries on this map project even higher increases over the 30 years. The fact that there are already over 200 million diabetics worldwide, coupled with the data shown on this map, leads me to the conclusion that the cause is not one of genetics, but one of an epidemic. And by the way, the scientists who put this data together are also calling it an epidemic. So what is an epidemic? Well, an epidemic is spreading rapidly and extensively by infection and affecting many individuals in an area or population at the same time, or widely prevalent. When I look at this map, I see widely prevalent. And it concerns me because when you have an epidemic of this magnitude, it means anybody can get diabetes. My point is, I'd like to see an end to using genetics or diabetic patients and their relatives as the cause of the disease. In fact, I'd argue that a more intelligent approach would be to look at what's changed over the past 100 years. It certainly hasn't been the human body and how it functions. But there are plenty of external contributing factors that have bombarded us in the past century, such as soil and water contamination, poor air quality, food additives, viruses and pathogens, sedentary lifestyle, to name a few. Now, if you want to throw genetics back in there, well, of course, if you bombard our unchanged systems with all of the above for 100 years, diseases such as diabetes are going to show up. The last major point I'd like to make regarding one other statistic I mentioned at the beginning of the show is a good example of how addressing one area could have a major impact on measurably improving our health outlook and providing diabetics with a positive patient return on investment. Diabetes is a leading cause of kidney failure, non-traumatic limb amputation, and new cases of blindness. These health issues are caused by one thing, lack of circulation. In diabetics, highly fluctuating glucose levels create toxic enzymes that wreak havoc on the blood vessels over time. The first to deteriorate and most vulnerable are the tiny capillaries and blood vessels. Our eyes, kidneys, and extremities depend on these capillaries and small vessels to deliver the oxygen and nutrients needed to survive. As deterioration begins, circulation is restricted, causing these organs and extremities to fail. Over time, risk of stroke and heart disease increase, also caused by lack of circulation in the larger blood vessels and arteries. This has been known for 80 years, yet after all these years, treatments still fail to include options to neutralize the negative effects on the capillaries, blood vessels, and arteries and heal the damage. Because maintenance and restoration of circulation is not offered as a treatment option, a diabetic's only recourse is major invasive surgery that can reduce or eliminate vision, require transplant, or amputation. In my opinion, using current knowledge to restore and maintain proper circulation would go a long way in contributing to a positive patient return on investment where patient dollars are invested in diabetes care. So in future shows, we'll explore some details associated with what I've discussed here today, including diabetic statistics, goals regarding patient collaboration, and the contributing factors to diabetes and their effects. Again, I ask for your input from you diabetics along the way, so please remember to join my blog, www.diabetesa1cforum.com, and provide comments that you think will help achieve the mission, influencing improvements in diabetes care through patient collaboration. 
Now we'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll have a talk with our guest, Bonnie Giadario, who has a thing or two to say about focusing on patient collaboration and advocacy is achieving measurable results with regard to lung cancer. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Diabetes A1C Forum. Today we're here with our guest, Bonnie J. Adario, founder of the Bonnie J. Adario Lung Cancer Foundation. And we're gonna be talking to Bonnie a little bit about her experience as a lung cancer patient and what happened after she went through the treatment process and why she formed her foundation. Bonnie, welcome to the show. Thank you, happy to be here, Patrick. So, uh, Bonnie, can you give us like an, an overview of what happened like when you were first diagnosed and, the, and your experience with healthcare and health insurance? what you sure. went, went through with that? Sure. It took almost six or seven months to actually get a diagnosis. So, really? Yeah. Wow. You know, lung cancer is, is a really tough disease to, to get a take on. But um, finally got diagnosed, and after I was told by several people there was nothing they could do, being a patient advocate, which I highly recommend people become when they're sick, I uh, found an amazing surgeon at UCSF and he put together a multidisciplinary team to take care of me that included a himself who is a thoracic surgeon, uh, an oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a pathologist, a pulmonologist, and they they actually had a meeting just about my case, mm -hmm. which should be standard of care and is not even yet today. And uh, they were able to do some fairly amazing things so I could be here today. So you would attribute that to this one individual who kind of took control and found the right team of people to yes, handle absolutely. your case. Yes, absolutely. And, that's, and that's, that wasn't common at the time. No, not at all. So, it, is, it is more common today, Yeah. but not necessarily in community hospitals. You'll find that mostly in major institutions. Oh, wow. Okay, well, after going through this process, so you, you, uh, your cancer went into remission and the dust settles. So right. what were you thinking at that time? And well, you know, um, my, I, I had chemotherapy, had radiation, had surgery. Uh, and during that time, especially when I was recuperating, I had a lot of time to learn about lung cancer. And even though my mother's brother and sister both died of lung cancer, when that happened, I just thought cancer was cancer. I didn't really understand that dif there were different cancers and different things happened to different mm -hmm. people. So I started, I started working through the internet uh -huh. to learn about it. And the one thing that really resonated with me was that the survival rate for lung cancer had stayed the same at 15% mm -hmm. for 45 years. And that just, speared me right into action. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, how about telling us a little bit about your foundation that you, that you uh, okay. put together after okay. going through all of this? Well, one of, the things, one of the things that was really clear for me on my journey was that after being told by two major institutions that there was no hope for me and finding one that found hope, I wanted that for all patients diagnosed with lung cancer. Mm -hmm. I think the survival rate of 15% had everything to do with the fact that there was really no good standard of care for lung cancer that existed on a, uh, on a regular basis throughout the system, throughout the health system. Mm -hmm. So that was a goal. That was really the reason I started the foundation. And then it's been one unmet need after another. Every time we found something that was broken, we went to work to fix it and see if we couldn't create a distribution system in lung cancer throughout the United States where we could deliver the right drug to the right patient at the right time. So uh, how does uh, patient collaboration, patient uh, advocacy come into all of this? How does that uh, provide a, 
Well, you know, collaboration comes across all venues in this disease and should in all diseases. You know, people, I think people have a, a thought process of what they think an advocate is. And I think they think of somebody that, you know, waving a flag on the, the Capitol steps, yeah. you know, being angry. And that's not really the case. It's really not the case. I know our foundation is clearly focused on only one thing, and that's the patient and getting the ac absolutely best treatment and research programs and, and uh, drugs early on so they have a chance at survival. That's what we fight for. So um, the, uh, how do the patients get involved in this? Well, you know, it's really, the foundation. In, it's, it's really interesting because uh, we, we tried many things and it's a slow process mm -hmm. and I'm in a hurry. I'm in a big hurry. I'm not getting any younger and I want to really, we really want to make a major impact, mm -hmm. you know, in a very short period of time. So we, um, we decided to have a support group. So we had one and we had about 30 people in the room. That was great. And then we thought, what's our message? So we decided to start inviting thought leaders in lung cancer, surgeons, oncologists, researchers, mm. PhDs, you know, across the spectrum to come and talk at these support groups and teach the patient. But then we thought, 30 patients in one room, that's not going to get us anywhere. Yeah. We, need, we need to do something bigger. And although there are cancer support groups on every corner for other diseases, lung cancer, they're hard to find. So we had a friend actually that was associated with Penn TV and uh, she came to work for us and said, well, why don't we live stream the support group? Why don't we live stream it and get this into patients' homes? So that's what we're doing now. We're getting, we're getting the benefit of all these amazing experts in lung cancer speaking at our support group. We're live streaming it into patients' homes and I'm happy to say we've reached almost 144 countries. Wow. Wow is right. How many, uh, do you have a rough idea how many patients you think roughly? Well, in our whole library series of, of um, patient lectures from these thought leaders, we've reached almost 500,000 people. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And growing, and growing. So how long a period of time did it take you to work from that group of 30 to 500,000? You know, 000? really not long. Uh, honestly, it started yeah. happening really because this is involved with Facebook and social media and mm -hmm. many other venues of getting the word mm -hmm. out. Press releases, you know, the thought leaders that are doing it, they're talking about it on their industry websites and, you know, where they're working. So, um, and we really haven't given that a huge push yet. We wanted to kind of wait and see you know, how it resonated with mm -hmm. the patients and, and such, but it's amazing. I can tell you, we had a, a 5K run in Rhode, I Rhode Island <clears throat> last November, I think, and this little lady comes running up to me and she wraps her arms around me and she's sobbing, absolutely sobbing. And I said, sweetheart, what's wrong? Are you okay? And she said, I just want you to know you saved my life. And I said, well, how did we save your life? And she said, I watched your cancer show Wow. on YouTube. <laughs> And uh, she said, I heard Dr. Gandera talking about molecular testing. She said, so I went to my doctor and I asked for a molecular test. And the first doctor said, I don't think you need one. She said, so I found one that would do it. And it turned out she had a particular marker that allowed her to take a targeted drug. Instead of infused chemo, she could take a pill every day. And she was just thrilled. Oh, that's a huge thrilled. improvement. Yeah. And yeah. that's across the United States. Yeah. You know, so. Wow. Yeah. So we have, um, so in, the, in um, with regard to that, uh, I've, I've heard you mention before about measurable results uh -huh. in terms of care. Right. So um, how would, uh, how does this uh, molecular testing uh, help with that, with measurable results? And maybe you could define okay. me what you think about as a measurable okay. result. Just for a simple, a simple example, we've, we've begun a program talking to community hospitals across the United States mm -hmm. and private oncologists that are in private practice and saying, if you will, f if you will follow a few of these things we're going to ask you to do, which is 100% molecular testing of all your patients and various other things, we will refer patients to you. We're calling them a stand, uh, centers of excellence. 
and we use a patient navigator in each site that gets back to us and gives us the information about the things that, that we've asked them to do. And in one case, at a hospital very close to here, when we first talked to them and they came on our program, they were testing somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% of the patients coming in. Now they're up to almost 80%. And, you know, various other things that were, that were very, very important to get the patient that standard of care that really has a tremendous effect on their survival. That's great. So yes. these patients, so the patients now, because of the foundation, you're starting to see uh, a measurable way Absolutely. in terms of improved health outlook. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, for um, sure. So um, with the um, foundation, what do you, to date, what do you think is uh, one of the most uh, amazing things that you've accomplished through the foundation? Well, we've gone from a small foundation right here in San Carlos, California. And I've just been asked to speak at the World Lung Cancer Congress in Vienna in 2016 and be part of a world organization. So the word is out that, you know, we have something significant to say and that we're doing some significant things related to survival for people with lung cancer and we're an international entity now. That's great. So, so you're establishing a place at the table for, for lung cancer patients Absolutely. along with Absolutely. healthcare and health insurance and industries. The one thing I can tell anybody listening that wants to have any kind of an advocacy like this, don't wait for someone to ask you to sit at the table. Okay, great piece of advice. Pull well, up a chair and sit down. <laughs> right. Well, Bonnie, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, and I appreciate your input, and hopefully we can emulate some of these things through Diabetes A1C Forum. We're big believers in collaboration, and what we do is yours. Thank you, Bonnie, for being here with us today. Um, I'd like to uh, suggest that we take a look at these comments that Bonnie's made and try to em employ some of those in Diabetes A1C Forum with regard to diabetic patients. And uh, again, patient advocacy is extremely important. Advocate for yourselves first and collaborate with other patients to strengthen that ad advocation of patients. And uh, we'll see you next month. Take care.